Hello, um, thank you for joining us. I'm Laura Dietz. Um, as the editor of the Gathering on Digital Literary Culture from Cambridge Elements in Publishing and Book Culture, I had the privilege today to interview Dr. Simon Rogery, author of one of the newest books in the series. His new title, The Early Development of Project Gutenberg, 1970-2000, is just available from Cambridge University Press. And to just hear a little bit more about the book, about what's in it, Simon, we would love to ask. Your first book, or the most recent one that you published, was on the Kindle, Four Shades of Grey. How did you go from studying Kindle history and Amazon history to Project Gutenberg history? So this was largely a case of thinking about the Gutenberg work as a prequel to the, the Kindle work and thinking about those pivotal moments in ebook history. And it turns out that things are a lot more complex in terms of Project Gutenberg, and this starts to unravel some of this narrative around the kind of linear progressive history of ebooks and demonstrate the, the kind of legal and technical complexities of doing something that seems just as simple as digitizing a public domain text. It does seem simple on the surface or the in the accepted story uh, that you unravel. Uh, you used a huge number of archives in producing this book. Were they physical, were they digital or both? Um, so the main archive I used was the uh, digital side of the Michael Hart collections um, at the University of Illinois. And these were interesting to me as my first born digital archives. They included emails that were very difficult to kind of figure out what conversation was going on within them. And also a lot of plain text files that had speeches, um, very polemical speeches that often didn't say when they were or things like that. So very difficult to provide trackable evidence. A lot of this material also came from other physical archives that I was visiting. So Hart was a prolific networker and he requested machines from Apple that were in the Apple archives and elsewhere. So it was interesting to see where Michael Hart, the founder of Project Gutenberg, turned up in my other research. Putting it all together. Um, because this book draw, draws so much on computing history, um, as much as uh, English literature, as much as book history, publishing studies, and the book is so relevant to scholars in such a number of disciplines, was it very challenging to speak to that range of scholarship um, and talk to that range of uh, possible audiences for the book? Yes, definitely. Um, I was lucky that there's this kind of, uh, the center of it, Project Gutenberg is a fulcrum that these disciplines kind of ro rotate around. That's a familiar subject that then you can introduce these different ideas such as platform studies, um, and literary history and things like that. And one of the key areas that um, is emerging within these kind of fields is the role of AI um, within publishing. And uh, luckily, the final chapter of my book is about extraction from Project Gutenberg. So it continues to be relevant, even though I wrote a lot of it before the, the kind of big wave of GPT in recent months. <clears throat> Remaining relevant. Um, the the mythology of Project Gutenberg unraveling is such a big part of this book and how the story, the, the narrative that is presented and it shows up in the obituary that opens the book saying this is what Michael Hart did. And when you went back into the history, the actual story is more complicated. Um, what do you think are the most uh, the most important misconceptions to unpick the stories that haven't got a good foundation um, in the actual facts, but might be causing difficulty or important misinterpretations if they're allowed to stand. So a lot of this would be the folklore around the very early years of Project Gutenberg, so 1971 through till 1989, where Michael Hart was this heroic person who would type these books all by himself and post it to uh, the main um, kind of military network, ARPANET. But it turns out that he did not have access to ARPANET, but it was rather some other network that nobody knows what, what it is, including himself. And that this work did not take place on major landmarks such as Independence Day, but probably a colder day in December. Um, so there's very little that we know about that uh, those early years. And that's where the basis of this idea of Project Gutenberg being the first ebook mm. provider comes from. And there's very little evidence for that. So why that has stuck around has been fascinating to unpack within this work. So why it has stuck around as much as the fact that it has, and this is an opportunity to correct the record in so many cases. So the last question I'll ask you today is, what comes next? If the Gutenberg book is in some ways a prequel to the Kindle material, um, will the next book be a prequel to the prequel? 
In, in a way, it's my most ambitious project, which is to instead encompass the entire period of the rise of the personal computer. So from the 70s or so onwards until 2000s and looking at how do people read on screen and building upon this archival research. So traveling out to different places and getting the evidence to show how people started to figure out how to read on screen, um, which is a very exciting uh, project that's in its very early stages and I'm hoping to get something up by the end of the decade. <laughs> that is going to be brilliant. Uh, Simon, thank you so much. Hearing more about the book has been great. Um, the For readers who want to have a look at it, it's in print and on ebook form from the uh, Cambridge.org website and in less than a decade's time, I hope, we'll be back talking about the new book. Thank you so much.